Thank you, Paige. So I'm going to give this talk with uh, Barry sitting right next to me. So we are going to take turns, and he was going to help me cover some of the bus detection. All right. So as Paige mentioned, this is going to talk about the, the dust analysis. But in order to understand this topic, why we care about dust events, I have to take you a few steps back into the history. So U.S. is a young country, but uh, we did have this uh, extreme environmental catastrophe called the Dust Bowl. Just put everybody on the same page. The Dust Bowl is a period in the 1930s of very, very severe dust storms. The cause of Dust Bowl was extended drought right after the Great Depression, and also have many, many years uh, in the building through very, very poor land management. So what happened is when this country was formed, the government encouraged everybody to go west. At the same time, very powerful machinery was invented. So people were able to completely destroy very deep grassland and convert it into cropland. So the first few years actually was a very happy time because that's what abundant rainfall. And then that's actually a very famous thing that um, you know, the rain just follows plow, the, the plow. But a few years after that, we have several years of very, very little water uh, rainfall and extreme drought for a few years. So first, the other crop died, mostly cotton and wheat. And after that, the land was completely barren. There's nothing to cover it. So the, when the wind kicks in, then you know, all the agricultural land are ready to emit dust. And that was a time that when, when you can see just a two or three large dust storms can strike 75% of the top soil of a farm. The dust can reach as far as ice line. I mean, today, people can dig into the ice core in Iceland and saw American dust there. And then there was a very famous event called Black Friday, a Black Sunday dust event, that when the dust storm originated from the central U.S., came to United, uh, to Washington, D.C., and blackened the sky of our capital. And that's when you know, the Congress started to take action. So that was a run of very uh, dramatic time. The agricultural ecosystem was completely destroyed. That was in the 30s, and uh, uh, people were driven out, half a million families. Some people said 2.5 million families uh, were forced to go west and go to the cities to find a job. Many of you probably read the very famous book, uh, The Grapes of Rest by John Steinberg. That was a time that um, was, was very, very difficult for Americans. So now the debate is, are we going to see another dust bowl or not, even in our lifetime? Right? So on one side of the story is, you know, historic data showing that the central U.S. plan saw severe drought, just like during the dust bowl period, at least once or twice a century in the past 400 years. So our past, the last one we had was 80 years ago. Uh, does that mean if history is going to repeat itself? We're going to see another one in 20 or 30 years. And the other side, you know, global warming is, is you cannot deny that. It's, it's going to force a precipitation shift away from the subtropics, and which is southwestern U.S. And we're going to see greater, evapor greater evaporation. We have less snow and ice cover. And also uh, because the snow and ice are melting earlier, so we're going to have earlier spring. All of this can work together to amplify the effects of natural climate oscillation, such as uh, El Nino or Southern Oscillation or ENSO. To a point that, you know, we're going to intensify the drought so much, and not just going to desertification, but we have a term called dust, dust bolification, which is come from a paper published in Nature uh, by Joseph Room in 2011. So this is the one side of the study. This people think that we are doomed. There's no way for us to go back. And that's something dramatic that happened. And on the other side, not everybody is buying into this idea. I think probably it's not going to happen because partially that suppose was a man-made disaster. And we have learned, hopefully, the lesson. 
read a paper published by um, uh, Jeff Lee and Tom Gill in 2015 arguing about that. And also that's a time when we were when the whole country was under extreme economic stress. That's right after the Great Depression. And now we are more resourceful. We are one of the richest country in the world. And uh, we also have many soil conservation measures in place through the great work of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, USDA. However, that's no judge uh, here to tell us which one is right. Uh, the jury is still out because there's no long-term data record for that storm to tell us which one is right. So that's how we came into the picture. Uh, we want to develop a long-term data record using the most robust data sources, including satellite, ground monitors, and a combination of, uh, of those platforms. So we started with the improved network, which, mean, uh, which uh, is the interagency monitoring of protected visual environment that's um, been operated by multiple agencies, including the National Park Service, US EPA, and states. Uh, NOAA I also was part of it. Um, so the data record can go back to 1988 with really great long-term data record. We have many sites in very close location to the dust sources. And then this, this one also has chemical composition and size distribution. So that's the that's a starting point for us. But how do you detect dust storm? Right? So the first thing we, we look at was the satellite data because the satellite is like a, a pair of eyes in the sky. Look at the Earth's surface. You can have a very, very clear picture of what is going on on Earth. Right? So here is a picture as shown in the middle. It's the true color image of one dust storm that swipe over northern Chihuahua Desert. But the red point is one of the improved site, uh, this Guadalupe Mountain National uh, Monument. So that site, we, uh, we found that it was collocated with the dust storm as observed by Moody's on April 15, 2003. So with this picture and collocated observations, and we start to look at the time series of different sites. For example, here the red arrow showing the PM10 concentration and PM2.5 concentration before, during, and after the dust storm. And we also look at other cases that's all listed here. For all cases, it's very clear, like when you have a dust storm, you have a, a spike of PM10 concentration and also PM2.5 concentration, which is kind of intuitive. And besides the PM10 and PM2.5 concentration, Increase. You are also seeing increase of the uh, change of the chemical composition. For example, silicon, calcium, potassium, and iron, they're all called crustal elements. Those elements mostly come from soil. So when you see a spike of PM2.5, you're also seeing spikes of all those, you know, uh, those elements concurrently. That means all of them come from the same sources, and in this case, from soil. So this is a, Another great thing about the improved network because it provides the chemical composition data that uh, provide the, uh, the fingerprint for us to identify the sources. However, not everything is increasing during dust storms. One of the things that's actually decreased was the PM2.5 to PM10 ratio. So PM2.5 is the fine particle. PM10 is the so fine particle plus the coarse particle. Because dust mostly made of very coarse particles. So when you have fresh dust emission, most of the particles should be of large size. That's why when you see a dust emission uh, add to the aerosol, and you should see a drop of the PM2.5 to PM10 ratio because you're adding more PM uh, coarse into the soup. That's why uh, for all the cases, you, you can see that uh, during the dust storm, you, you are seeing a drop of PM uh, 2.5 to PM10 ratio. So we repeat this kind of data training with satellite data, and, and I try to identify the indicators of dust storms, and we find something very, very consistent. So there are at least five dust indicators. You have high PM2.5, PM10 concentration. 
you have no ratio, and you have also have high cross flow fraction. And uh, another thing I didn't list here is anthropogenic fraction there was no. So for anthropogenic uh, fraction, we're using copper, lead, and zinc as an indicator. And then finally, you also have very low enrichment factor. So enrichment factor is a concept that's widely used in geology. So basically, if the also is the same as the soil, then you, the enrichment factor should be one. If you add something else into it, then the, the enrichment factor for that element should be higher than one. So we are using this statistical method called a cluster analysis to process all the data, and we identify one group, which is group one here. For all the indicators, this group match everything perfectly. So this group we call a dust group. That's how we identify dust from the improved network. And next, we are going to talk about uh, another method that we identify dust from the air now. Barry, you want to take over? Sure. So, um, so air now is essentially like um, regulatory monitors that the states put up in the EPA, gather the data in real time, and serve the nation. So the downside to air now is that one, um, they don't have speciated data. All they have is PM10, so these are larger particles, or PM2.5, which are smaller particles. And then they also have um, some other measurements such as wind speed, relative humidity, temperature. So um, what we did is we took this air now data, we applied um, this method that was developed for um, surface monitors in Tel Aviv and adapted it to the United States. So what we, what we did is we, we took that and we said, okay, if the three hour average of PM is less than or greater than 100 micrograms per meter cubed, then you can have dust. But using some of the lessons learned that we have from Daniel's um, improved method is we can basically then also say, well, if there's co-located monitors of PM 2.5 and PM 10, then we can also apply an additional threshold where if the ratio is less than a certain amount, we can call that dust. But it's st you still have to have high PM10 concentrations. And then we can also, we know that um, other variables are also very indicative of dust storms, such as wind speed. So if you have high wind speed, we could say that we have high winds, you can have a probability to have dust. So Together with this, we can then create an aggregate or an adaptive algorithm that can detect dust, but in a much higher temporal resolution. So unlike improve, which is what a daily average every three days, air now gives you hourly data where we can do this in near real time. And so um, kind of the way it works is you have to start off with PM10, and then you, ha you say, okay, we have PM10, did we detect dust? All right, then look, if there's a PM2.5 monitor, we add in the PM2.5 method. And then if there's wind speed, we say, okay, well, we can add in wind speed to either just the PM10 monitor or plus the hybrid tongue method. And that gives us a, essentially a new um, dust detection algorithm that is adaptive and also more robust than just the regular um, Ganner method because it includes more observations. So this is an example. So again, we're gonna stick with the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, on what we're showing here is a, a Veers image of the dust detection. So in pink is essentially where you would see all of the dust, detect, dust that was detected from um, the Veers satellite. And so what you can see is it, is it essentially blows up from northern Mexico and extends out into um, over El Paso and into um, New Mexico and Texas. So if we 
look at a PM10 monitor in El Paso, what we can see is that overall the background PM concentration is very low, but then as soon as there's a dust storm, you see this huge spike in dust. Um, and so what's shown in blue are the hours that were detected in dust, and this correlates exactly with where the plume was noticed using the satellite observation. Thank you, Barry. So now we want to show some exciting results using those dust detection algorithms. So here is the long-term time series of dust storm over the United States. That's getting from improved network. Remember, improved was one of the longest data record uh, with, um, in, in this country. So on the y x scale is the number of dust storms, and then at x was the number of years, and years from 1988 to 2011. That's our uh, study end uh, at the time. So in the 1990s, on average, we get about 20 large dust storms every year. In the, year of two, in the decade of 2000, we get 48 dust storms every year. So even you look at the time series, it's not changing you know, monotonically. However, in the second decade, even the most quiet year, which is 2005, you have the number of dust storms less as frequent as that uh, of the most dusty and uh, dusty of the year in the 1990s. So obviously there's something uh, is happening and then the trend is very clear. That just in 20 years, we are seeing the frequency of dust storm increase by 240% in 20 years. So just put that into the global context. So the global dust trend actually is decreasing at about 1.2% per year. And in the U.S., because we have 20 years and 240%, we're, we're actually increase of 12% per year. So it's uh, 10 times faster than the global average and at, uh, in the opposite direction. The question is, what is driving the dust trend in the United States? So we look at uh, the correlation between dust storms and a bunch of long-term and short-term indicators like, for example, the ANSO, the drought index, precipitation, soil moisture, AO is uh, uh, Arctic oscillation and uh, North Atlantic oscillation. And we also uh, group the dust sites into two groups. One is called LL, no latitude a desert, that's including Chihuahua, Mojave, and Solaran. And also we have high latitude desert, including Great Basin and Colorado Plateau. So for both groups, actually the PDO stands out. PDO has the highest coordination with both groups. So PDO basically describes the sea surface temperature change over the North Pacific Ocean. So why sea surface temperature change in the North Pacific Ocean driving the dust trend over the United States? So this is the change of sea surface temperature between the two decades. And uh, we basically got the data from NASA's Giovanni. It's an online system. Probably you heard about it in earlier HECAS seminar, so I'm not going to talk about it here. So basically what I'm showing here is the temperature difference. We have a warm fossil over the North Pacific Ocean. And then also we have a relatively cooler change right next to the west coast of the United States. So with this pattern, you are going to see it's going to shift to the wind directions. It's actually going to move more lossy wind to the, uh, to the western U.S. Uh, com if compared to the other uh, conditions. So compared to the southly wind, northly wind is cooler and drier. That means this area is going to get less precipitation. And that's exactly what I'm showing uh, here in this Lies. That's the change of soil moisture between the two decades. It's also getting from Giovanni with NLDC data. Um, so NL dust data, North, uh, North America land uh, data simulation system. So this is a basically a combination of model and observations. You have the blue color, that means it's getting wetter you have more precipitation. 
and red color getting drier. In large part of the western, southwestern United States, you are seeing predominantly the red color. That means this area is getting drier between the two decades. That's why you are seeing more dust storms. So soil moisture here is the key. Why is that? So this is go back to, goes back to the fundamentals of the dust emission. So any dust particles is controlled by three things, three forces. One is the gravity. So the bigger the particle is, it's more difficult to lift it. So that's why the larger particles like here can only creep at the surface. They cannot be lifted up. The smaller ones can be lifted up more easily. And then um, the, the, the second force is the wind stress. So the smaller ones, uh, again, um, and then the stronger the wind is, the easier to uh, blow particle off. But the most important one probably is the third force, which is the cohesive bonding between particles. So for large particles, the bonding is very weak. For smaller particles, they can bond very strongly, huddling together uh, very lightly. So end up, it's not a large particle, it's not a smaller particle that can be lifted up first. It's always the media size relatively is 440 microns to 200 microns, which is a micrometer in diameter. That will be lifted up first. And this group of particles will be lifted up, they're gonna jump, they come back to the surface, smash the surface, and then they break down the large aggregates into smaller ones, and then smaller ones can be picked up again. That's how we initiate dust emission in the, in the nature, in nature, natural environment. So that's how we actually predict the dust emission in the models too. This is one example using the dust emission FENSA model that uh, I uh, deliver, uh, developed at EPA, but now Barry is more uh, that's taking over that uh, to implement uh, in other NOAA models and other models. So this is a very complicated algorithm, but essentially its dust emission is kicked off by two parameters. One is uh, U star, which is a fraction velocity, or uh, you can more or less think about this as a wind speed. And other one is threshold fraction velocity, which is the key value determined by soil texture, land surface conditions, and also soil moisture. So this is how soil moisture affect the dust emission, so at least through three pathways. The first pathway is water just supports vegetation growth, right? So if you have a vegetation cover, um, then the wind energy will be partitioned, which means some of the wind energy cannot be directly applied to the soil surface. So that you are losing some wind energy and it protects the soil surface. The second one is the moist that actually can increase the cohesive bonding and make it more difficult to lift up the particles. And this is what we're using the FACN 99 scheme and also are there are other schemes there, but all of these basically it has a relationship between the moist content and then the, the force you need to lift up the dust. So there are other pathways, for example, uh, soil moisture, higher soil moisture can help build a crust and also build up uh, biological activities that further form bio crust, but all of the, uh, those are not reflected in the current uh, generation of models. Hopefully in the future, we will be able to do that. But all of it is working in one direction. Basically, you have more water, then uh, you have less dust emission. You have less water, you have more dust emission. So essentially, it's the large system that's controlling the local events, including dust. So let's give you some example how we did the dust forecasting. On the, on the lower left, uh, on up left, uh, that's one of the earlier simulations we did over in the state of Washington, actually, is the dust storm from cropland. That actually was the first time we started to use satellite data for model evaluation because that, that's the area we do not have an 
have any um, monitors at the time. We could not find any monitors at the time. And and it's, it should happen in the western, uh, in the central Washington area at that time. We do not see any um, monitors that were able to capture this event. But uh, the Moody's two images actually nicely capture this event and showed us the right shape of the right curve of the plume. So that was when uh, we started to work with uh, satellite products for model evaluation. But the lower, uh, lower right, that's another very memorable event for me because our model been running for a couple of years and then I become uh, a little bit more confident of this. And I was in California for emission, for an emission uh, conference and I saw this huge storm coming. And actually, I was brave enough to step up uh, to the town hall and announce it. I didn't know how many people believed me uh, on the spot. But the next day, everybody was talking about it because this storm killed two people uh, on Highway 80. So that was the time I, I feel like, um, you know, if we have the right communication channel, uh, we are able to deliver this message to the right people at the right time, and we might um, be able to save their lives. So that was part of the motivation. I'm um, so happy to join HECAS and uh, to communicate our science to stakeholders, hopefully we can help reduce uh, tragedy like this. And on the lower right, there was um, the FUNSA scheme be applied to a global dust forecasting system that Barry is working on. Uh, so hopefully we are not be able to uh, just um, supply um, products to the US, but also to other people in need. So, with that, I want to shift the gear a little bit, talking about the impact of the increased dust storm on our society, even for people who are not living in the area. So to understand that, you have to understand what is inside the dust storm, right? So what is inside the dust storm is not just the soil particles. It's basically, it can be anything, whatever of the right size, in the right place, at the right time. It can be part of a dust storm. That's um, uh, it's a quote from uh, uh, Bill Spring, uh, who is, um, uh, is also one of our team members on the dust projects. So when you look at the dust, you should think about this is a soup uh, with a lot of things inside it. One thing that's of particular interest to us is the coxy fungus. So the very fever is an infectious disease caused by people in inhaling and this fungus. Fungus have been living in American deserts for I don't know how many years, right? Uh, would be hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, in a natural environment, it exists just like a mold, right? So we'll get some water, grow a little bit, and go back to the dry conditions. However, once the spore of the fungus being healed by humans, then the spore will get almost unlimited supply of moist and also nutrition. And all of this are going to support the fungus to grow, reproduce very rapidly. So in a few weeks, this fungus can grow uh, in, you know, so fast that um, you know, can, can have caused non-infections and also a bunch of other problems. That's because this fungus is actually very, very tiny. It can tr be transported in blood so the fungus can flow into your brain and wipe out people's memory. And it can also grow out of skin and become very, very nasty. So one of our HICAS uh, workshop was held in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. So I'm uh, on my way back from the HICAS meeting. Actually, I was talking to my Uber driver and asked him, of course, uh, do you know Valley Fever? And he told me his daughter actually got Valley Fever. And, um, but fortunately, she recovered. However, after she recovered from valley fever, she forgot, you know, basically uh, the skill about her work. So that's because the, the fungus uh, went to her memory, uh, her brain, and wiped out that part of the memory. So she, basically, she had to retrain herself for the same old job uh, she had to go back to. So that was um, uh, it's actually pretty um, stressful for a lot of families in that region. So this is a step from CDC. So from 1997, 
states like Arizona start to officially record the, the cases of valley fever. And then later, California and other states joined. Right? So uh, if you look at the data from like 2000 to 2011, it's almost like 800% increase of, uh, of in infection. Uh, you can argue that probably because we are in people are, are more aware of this uh, or the physicians are, are doing a better job to diagnose it. However, um, this is not simply driven by that. Uh, you can see that the, the, the trend actually is pretty strong. And then we, uh, the peak was 2011. After 2011, the number uh, came down a little bit, but recent years are tipping back. Uh, it's a very interesting pattern is previously, Arizona is the primary, which is uh, in this uh, green color, it's the primary uh, states um, that contributing to a large number of Cases, um, but in recent years, is mostly the, the increase in California, especially in Kern counties and then uh, the southern Central Valley. Right now, we are seeing already 4,000 deaths by valley fever. This is probably one of the largest public health um, crises in, in this country, but it's uh, less uh, known to people outside the region. So. Um, all because the fungus are living in the soil, right? Naturally, you will think that a uh, dust storm will have something to do with it. So we are putting the number of the, uh, the location and the number of dust storms, and also the cases of valley fever together. So the background color here is the number of valley fever cases in each state. The darker the color is, that means there's more cases. And the red pie is the number of dust storms detected in those locations. The larger the pie is, you get a more frequent dust storms. So in general, those, um, that's a, a special pattern. And we also um, actually spend more time look at Arizona, and we find that only in the sites that near the urban centers in Arizona has a higher correlation of valley fever infection. However, this is still very early research. Uh, it's Basically, static uh, correlation is not really a causation. A fully physical basis to understand um, probably is needed um, you know, to further understand how uh, dust and um, very few are linked. So, very few is not the only concern of rising dust storm. We are having um, if you if you go to the desert or you, like here, I'm looking at uh, Owens Lake. Owens Lake is uh, the single largest dust source in the United States. However, right next to Owens Lake, you are seeing several large solar farms. That's because the land there is uh, relatively cheap. And the problem with that is, uh, if you have a very active dust source, then dust is going to frequently cut the solar panels, cover the solar panels. But if you if the solar panel is covered by 10% of dust, um, then they can reduce the productivity of solar panel by 50%. So this is a big concern for the solar energy industry if we're going to see more dust storms. The other concern is the highway safety. So dust storm is uh, very uh, dangerous for, for, for people driving the highways. Uh, it's for several reasons. One is obviously loss of visibility. You cannot see anything. I used to show a movie um, showing that people are actually driving into dust storms. However, I didn't get the license. Uh, uh, I didn't have time to uh, talk about license. I cannot show here. But bas basically, what you are seeing here is you are driving into the dust storms, right? And you see the cloud. Once you get inside the cloud, it's completely dark. And inside the dark cloud, there's nothing you can do about it. You can stop there, but you can hit by people from behind, or you can keep driving, but you may hit other people. So the best way actually is to do not get into dust storms. However, a lot of dust storms um, come so um, sudden that you could not have uh, time to respond. So that's actually what happened. There's a lot of killer dust storms are not these huge storms, but relatively very small dust storms that come from nowhere and I give people very, very little time to respond. So here we're, uh, we're showing some results we have not uh, published yet, but uh, we'll be happy to share with you. Here is the number of people died from dust storms and 
compared to that uh, from other extreme weather events, including high wind, thunderstorms, lightning, fire weather, and hurricanes. In most of the years, uh, except probably uh, the recent two years, that uh, dust storm actually killed more people than hurricanes. And uh, it's, it's also very, um, it's very similar situation for fire, right? So dust probably killed more people in, than fire weather in most of the years, except uh, probably 2018, we have the campfire. So that's how important dust is uh, for, for transportation. So I want to spend some time to talk about what we can do about it um, and how you can participate or use uh, all resources available for you if you're interested in to work on dust detection or early warning system. So one of the cool projects um, is the NASA Global Observer. Basically, it's a cell phone app that you can download from app, iOS, or from Google Android. In the app, you, you, you are able to take pictures, and then the app will automatically send the information with your pictures, like the location and time, to a LASA server. And then LASA server is going to filter your data, basically mostly just make sure there's no privacy issues, and then upload your picture into a database. And that database will be shared with everybody. And everybody uh, has, um, can access the data. I will show you later how you can access uh, this data. And, and this is a great way. If you see a dust storm, you want to report it, and you want to share it with scientists or with other citizens, and you can do it uh, through this global observer uh, app. So this is one of the ways you can do it. This work mostly uh, led by um, Marini uh, Roberts from NASA Langley and also Hannon Amos from NASA Goddard. So they, I put in their emails here. If you are interested in participating in this, you can uh, approach them directly. The other app actually uh, is designed to save lives. Uh, it's called Dust Watch, the app for highway safety. So basically, the Dust Watch provides real time warning for four things. One is visibility change. Second is high wind conditions. The third one is dust condition. And last one is an inhalable, uh, inhalable particle concentration of PM2.5. So this is actually was designed by a group of high school students and that's using our data. And uh, you can, right now you can download a dust watch app from iOS store, but uh, the Android version is not out yet. There's High school students plan to work on this next summer. And you can also, I put their name, uh, email here, you can contact them if you're interested in that. So I want to wrap up the formal presentation and then go uh, to give some hands on training on how to use the data. So the take home message here is that the US air quality is improving, which is increasing. However, the dust storms and wildfires actually are increasing. So um, it's probably going the opposite way and then dust and fire probably will become more uh, prominent in the US air quality studies. That's the one message uh, I want to deliver here. Second is the rising dust storm actually is going to impose imminent risk on a lot of uh, our local communities. Uh, public health, so valley fever I talk about, there are also other uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and um, other premature deaths associated to dust storm exposure other than valley fever, especially the work for, by uh, uh, Jim's, um, um, what's his last name? Sorry, I just forgot his last name, but uh, in, uh, he, uh, he, he did some coordination work between dust storm and, and uh, the, uh, the premature deaths. So that was a very nice work uh, that highlights other health impact. And people also get asthma and other issues with that. And also have an impact on transportation safety, solar energy and agriculture and so on. And satellite data can, um, with, uh, you're gonna see uh, previously from our slides and also in a few minutes, satellite data can offer a, diff a, a, a number of capabilities that help us monitor dust storms and also predict the dust storm. So um, 
with that, I'm going to move on to some trainings. So first thing is, uh, I want to show you how to get the monitor data. So we have, this is a, a website that we delivered to provide a one-stop data service for ground monitor data. So we have three, we have four, actually four networks here. One is improved, second one is LNOW, third one is global, which is the global observer app data that we, uh, we showed earlier. And then last one is uh, the uh, ISD, actually. SD is a weather station data that um, all the airports are keeping for, for years. So for each of the data sets, you can click uh, the button and understand what is inside the data and who uh, to contact if you want to request the data, okay? So I want to show some demo. All of this information will be uh, available to you later, so you don't have to, uh, you have to limit what I'm doing. So for example, I want to look at the improved data, right? So I just click the improved data, and then I click submit. I will be able to see all the improved detected dust storm during this period, right? So that, that's how you get improved. And you can also look at the LNOW. So you click LNOW, and you can choose different days, for example. Um, here, for example, we are going to look at uh, LNOW data. You can zoom in and to look at um, the environment settings here. For example, this is Owens Lake I mentioned here. It looks like a lake uh, in the map, but actually if you zoom in, you look at the satellite data, it's actually a dry lake, it has no water inside it. So that's why it's such an active dust source. And you can, I, I forgot exactly the location, but the large uh, solar panel uh, farms probably is somewhere here. So that's how um, this actually can impact uh, our economy and, and other things. And you can also get uh, the global data here. This is the pictures people took and sent to you. But I have to warn you, this is a citizen science platform. So the data actually, um, you have to use caution to use the data because some people are new to use the app to report or they do not understand exactly what they're seeing. So you basically have to filter the data, but those data mostly are the pictures that you are, you are seeing here. But this nice thing about the global is really global. <laughs> you can get a global picture, especially uh, where you, you go to Africa and also the Middle East. There are some very indigenous people are taking pictures and send it to us. So that's um, because we don't have ground monitors there and sometimes satellite can be blocked by cloud and those actually are useful resources for us uh, to understand what's going on in the rest of the world. Okay, so that's the ground data sets. Uh, right now we have a temporary link. Uh, this probably will change, so I'm not gonna send a link there, but if you are interested in using this data service, you can email me. Uh, my email, I will put my email on the slides. You should be able to find me. So that's one of the online resources they can use to get a ground monitor data. So about satellite data, probably the best one is going to the water view. Uh, right now, uh, they have several data products there. So water view, you have at the bottom is the time, you can pick up a time. And at the top, uh, on the left, you are showing this different satellite layers. You can add the layers and then look at that. So one of these large dust storm was 2019, April 10th. That was a, a huge storm that we have rarely seen in recent years. It's almost as big as what you are seeing during the dust bowl time because this dust storm actually oriented in the uh, northern Mexico region, the Chihuahua Desert, and go all the way to Minnesota people actually reported the slow deposition 
Mexican desert dust snake. So this is one of the largest ones. So we will take a look of this case here. So you can go to add nails, and they have a lot of air quality data, and, and they also have a separate dust storm category. You can play with different, uh, different products and get a sense of it. So for example, I add a few here, uh, including the dust surface mass, which is from the measure measure two reanalysis data. So measure two is a combination of model data and observation data. So the model actually was constrained by satellite observation. So the data actually um, is is pretty useful in that to give you a general sense uh, of you know where you see dust storms. Right now you cannot see the coastline. You have right. Thank you, Barry. If you drag it up, you will be able to see it. So that's uh, one of the tricks. The other, the other product I like um, is using uh, this um, also index. You know, this is from uh, from Aura Omi. So the the fingerprint is uh, pretty um, pretty big, and um, but they they do. Uh, have a very uh, good capability to detect the plume here. That's the nice thing about uh, the, the also index data. You have other products you can try, like dust score. This actually has a very accurate description of the plume. So this is also uh, uh, this is from uh, ELS um, as about the Aqua satellite. This is one uh, of the things uh, actually is pretty useful if you just try to understand is this a dust or not. And it's a dust score level two data. And they have a product for the day and also product for the light. That's added another advantage of using both day and the light data set. Of course, you're going to have um, the Moody's combined uh, data. So the both is combined the data. The nice thing about that is it's combining dark target and also deep blue algorithm. So the two algorithms can work um, in harmony to give you a, a good picture of what is going on. In this case, you know, they, they were able to show uh, this, this, this storm, but unfortunately there's a lot of cloud on that day. So a lot of, um, of the, the other part of the Room was uh, filtered out because of. What do you think? If you uncover what it shows it is. Yeah. Looks so like. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Barry was suggesting that uh, we shoot a cloud, and that you are seeing why a lot of the data was filtered out because they they have to filter by cloud fraction. So this is a water view. You can, if you have time, I encourage you to play with the water view. Look at all the individual. Uh, Products on, on the dust storm category, so that they actually are put. Um, the NASA people are putting a lot of effort into it, and hopefully, will become uh, useful for for some of you. There's another tool. It's called a uh, Alpha Watch. It's relatively uh, new, and also it's a kind of intermediate product. So I'm not going to. Um, send a, a link here, but uh, I, I will be happy to share it with you if you are interested. So this one, the nice thing about Alpha Watch is, it's a, a one site that provides you both geostationary and polar opting. So here, like Go 16 is geostationary, and Go 17 is geostationary. Views, uh, this is views from Somi MPP, and also views from NOAA 20. They are polar opening. So you can combine polar opening and geostationary uh, dust detections and, and have a, a better view. So I will uh, show you the same events we, sh we saw at the NASA world view, which is uh, the April 10th. You first choose the day. And because we want to see the boundaries, so we're going to zoom in to this region and see the boundary closer. Okay, 
So now I want to add a, I want to add the locations. So here, what you are showing uh, here is uh, the true color image. And because uh, geospatial data take a picture every five minutes, five to 10 minutes, so you have to select the time. And I started with uh, uh, 17, because that's uh, the daytime in a region. You go to the end, I submit it. So you see daylight. And then you can start to play the movie, okay? So the movie is showing actually the dust storms. This is a white sand in New Mexico. And this is a lot of sources from northern Mexico. It actually used to be agricultural area, but this area is getting get a lot of droughts. So a lot of sources um, become active. And that's also a tiny one. This is a, a Wilcox player in, uh, in Arizona. We, um, we actually saw this, uh, a lot of human activity in the prayer. So that's, on that day, that's why we, we saw a very active dust plume out of this region. This is just uh, from the true color, uh, but you can, you can see how, how things are moving and uh, how dust storms, where dust storms started and how it's transported, right? So this is a, this is a true color. And then they also they have a separate product for dust. It's called dust RGB. It's going to take a while to know the data. So remember, the pinkish color is dust, and uh, the brown or the, the, the red color is actually cloud. So almost uh, very, very similarly, uh, you are seen from the true color, but this is actually give you a kind of digitalized uh, data set tell you where dust is. So we have a lot of dust sources uh, in this region and also the white sand and the, uh, the, uh, the Wilcox player, right? So this is a light nice detection. So that's uh, from geostationary. And uh, you can go look at um, the view state on the battery shoot earlier. They also have a dust RGP. So the nice thing about uh, geos uh, polar orbiting is they can look at the, the picture uh, on the surface at um, um, a short distance. So basically, the quality of the data actually is much higher. Here, it, it's actually, um, even it's only one snapshot, but it's got the, uh, almost all the features are very, very uh, accurately. So this is, uh, this is from uh, VOS data. So this is a combination of geostationary and, and uh, polar orbiting. All of these can be used to support your dust detection, model evaluation, and also help you to identify the sources. I think with that, um, this is um, pretty much I have for today. Wonder do we have any questions? H, I will turn the mic back to you.